Okay, so welcome back to part four of our NCCP Refresher 101. This is one of my favorite subjects when I do initial classes. And it's because I get to incorporate not just emotional stress, but physical stress into this. They go hand in hand. Um, first stage, alarm. Um, this is your fight or flight. So your brain recognizes uh, an, an acute critical event and it your body has to protect itself. You either have to fight to the death or you have to run further and faster than you've ever run before. And so your body starts pumping out chemicals. Um, cortisol and adrenaline and you know norepi all those things to vasodilate some vessels vasoconstrict others you need to turn on big muscle groups and you need to shut off small muscle groups you need to turn on organs of survival and shut off ones that you don't need right now so if you want to run or fight, you need your big muscles to do that, your quads, your hamstrings, your, uh, your glutes, your butt muscles, right? Your abdominal muscles, your chest wall, um, shoulders, biceps for push, pull, punch, kick, run, twist, lift, jump, okay? Um, you do not need fine muscle control or fine motor control in your fingers. Um, that's why you vasoconstrict um, those, and that's why you get kind of fumbly fingered. You read stories or interviews um, or videos, whatever, of police officers and soldiers and civilians who talk about being in a firefight and not being able to do a magazine change because they dropped the magazine. <clears throat> they um, <clears throat> talk about not being able to work a doorknob. Back to the original Magnum, um, there's a scene where he's, don't look at the dogs, work the lock. Don't look at the dogs, work the lock. He's trying to get the car keys into the Ferrari so he can get into the Ferrari before the dogs eat him. And he's having trouble doing it. It's fight or flight, okay? Um, you also hear about people who lose control of their bladder or their bowels during a crisis situation, whether it be a firefight in the jungles of Vietnam or whether it be in a shooting at Walmart, okay? And that's because you don't need your bowels for this event. You don't need your mesenteric um, vasculature. So your body vasoconstricts and you lose control of those sphincters and you lose those fluids, okay? I tell you that so you understand how this is working, but I also want you to know that if you're in one of these life-threatening crises, if you lose control of a body fluid, you're not a coward. And there are, I mean, you read stories about this where people, part of their PTSD was that they felt that they were cowards because they pissed their pants during this event or they um, shit themselves, whatever it is. And, and some of this, as far back as, I mean, as far, as long as we've had warfare, as long as we've had violent crises, um, it's not that you were a coward, it was a physiologic response to stress, okay? Um, and if I can have one person realize that and have less nightmares because of it or less feelings of self, doubt. That's part of my gig here, okay? Now, <clears throat> is fight or flight healthy for you? Is that physiologic state of body healthy for you? It is for a few minutes at a time. Um, your heart rate at 120, 130, 140 in short bursts is healthy for you. Um, your Use, increased use of glucose during that time is healthy for you. Um, but over a period of time, the longer you're in fight or flight, the, the, the more 
side effects you have from it. Okay. So your second stage, resistance. This is this event is now over with. Okay. You are now trying to mentally, physically adapt to it and cope to the status of your body currently. So this is where you are um, fixing things. So um, alarm is fight or flight. One of the other phrases they use for this second stage is called feed or breed. And I'm not talking breed like, you know, breeding new humans. I'm talking about feeding your cells and breeding repair, breeding um, um, new cells that might have been damaged or injured in this event. Okay, so this is where everything turns and gets back to normal. So during fight or flight, your sympathetic nervous system kicks in. Heart rate, your adrenals, um, fight or flight. In order to cope with that and adapt back to normal, your parasympathetic system kicks in, your feed or breed system. It vasoconstricts those vessels that were bigger and it vasodilates the ones that got smaller. Um, it also causes some um, bronchoconstriction because fight or flight, you bronchodilate. You wanna be able to pull more oxygen in and blow off more CO2, that's waste product. But during this resistance adaptation and coping, you go back to normal. Your um, bronchioles um, constrict back to the normal size. Now, think about this for those of you who are AEMTs and you are giving a nebulizer. I'm going to give out butyrol, or am I going to give out butyrol and do, you know, um, ipitropium bromate, um, atrament, which is a dual neb? Your albuterol is a sympathetic drug. It causes a similar response as fight or flight. It bronchodilates, right? It, it increases heart rate a little bit. Um, the atrovent part of the duoneb knocks down your parasympathetic system. It's a, it's a parasympatholytic. It blocks that vasoconstriction that your parasympathetic system is trying to do. So it allows that drug to work better. Okay, so sympathetic, fight or flight, parasympathetic, adaptation, coping. Third stage is exhaustion. Now, the longer you're in fight or flight, the longer it takes to adapt and cope, the more risk you are for exhaustion and serious illness. Um, one of my daughter's first big calls as a paramedic, this lady came running out of the house and handed her a limp dead baby and said, save my baby. Okay. Boom, alarm stage, fight or flight. Okay. Um, we know that a call like that, you're talking anywhere from depending on your level of care to um, what is expected of you and your system, you're talking anywhere from five to 30 minutes on scene, okay? Working the kid, um, then you've got your transport time and you're in the ER and where there's a huge amount of stress and you're trying to yell so that they can, you can be heard um, while you're giving a report and you're helping do compressions on the kid because you're trying to help out in the ER too. Um, and then you're going outside to put your truck together. Let's say an hour of fight or flight. Now you're putting your truck back together and everything's kind, kind of coming back to normal and you get in the passenger seat of the truck and before you leave the hospital parking lot, you're dozing off because you're exhausted. This was an exhausting scenario. Now, <clears throat> you go to a big structure fire, the Christian Conference Center in Alton, is one I can think of, uh, I don't know, was that 12, 13 years ago, where it was like Dante's Inferno. Literally, there were 150 homes and cabins and camps involved in this, and it was just Dante's Inferno. And my orders were, you're taking D side, put those two fires out, and then don't leave unless it's life threat. Um, you're going to prevent the spread of the fire this way. And I knew that my son, was on a forestry truck behind me. That's a lot of fight or flight right there, okay? Um, you now picture 9-11. How long were these responders that were trying to 
dig their partners and friends and coworkers and peers out of the rubble, how long were they in fight or flight? How long did it take them to adapt and cope? It explains why so many of them became sick and a number of them passed early in their lives. Um, and it can be related straight back to 9-11. So I, I gotta think that the, uh, the amount of time you're in fight or flight played a big part in that. Now I talk about this so that you know if you have this alarm stage event, um, whether it's you're in Walmart and the power goes out, <laughs> that's an alarm stage or it should be, or whether you are on a bad EMS call, um, that you know you're at risk to get sick. So the things that can help you stay healthy are hydration, vitamins. Vitamin C is a big one. Um, good nutrition and good sleep. So for the next day or two or three after an event, make sure you get enough sleep, make sure you hydrate. Um, drink a gallon of water a day, not eight glasses, okay? Um, and take some vitamins um, and take care of yourself um, and watch out for your coworkers, see how they're handling this. Um, <clears throat> an example I use for this a lot is, uh, you know, back when I was still heavy and I ate a lot of cheesy poofs, I'm sitting watching the Red Sox and I'm not paying attention to anything but the Red Sox. And I got a bowl of cheesy poofs on my belly and I'm eating the cheesy poofs and somebody kicks the front door of my house in, okay? Now, boom, fight or flight. I either have to run out the back door, cross the field and into the woods further and faster than I've ever run, or I have to turn and fight to the death, right? So heart rate, all that stuff. I turn, I face the door, my cheesy poofs go flying, Max the dog's eating all my cheesy poofs, and I realize that it's just the fact that one of my sons didn't close the door tight, and Augusta one, you know, blew it open. I storm over, I kick the door shut, I come back over, I'm trying to pick up my cheesy poofs, um, I sit back down, and now I'm just, I'm shaking, right? I'm trying to stuff a cheesy poof in my mouth, and I miss my mouth. I, you know, it's like the old airplane movie, I take a glass of water, and I hit my head with it. So for a couple of minutes, I'm in fight or flight, five or 10 minutes now to get back to normal, and two innings later, I'm asleep, okay? Please keep this in mind when you have one of these events. Take care of yourself afterwards. Examples of stressful calls. Well, 9-11, certainly. I can't imagine seeing, I can't imagine being there. Thank God I wasn't. Um, bottom left, gruesome injuries. Uh, Personally, I'd be like, hey, can you make a fist? I want to see tendons and stuff move. Okay. Um, top right is a Pulitzer Prize winning photo, um, which the photographer, mind you, after the fact, has publicly stated he wished he never took. That was the Oklahoma City bombing. And that's a um, sheriff handing a um, dead baby to a firefighter. Um, very stressful call. Um, death, of an in death or injury of a coworker. Um, I have, over the course of my career, um, seen and done a lot of awful things. Um, but the death of, uh, of my buddy Don, um, in a helicopter, um, crash back, uh, Thanksgiving of 93 was the worst. Um, and it affected a lot of people all through New England between the, uh, medic, um, Matthew Jetton and the um, flight nurse, Don McIntyre, a lot of people through Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont knew these guys, and it caused a lot of, um, a lot of stress for a lot of people, okay? Um, so, death or injury of a coworker. Infant, elder, spouse abuse, certainly, you know, we wanna beat the living hell out of some of the people that we go on calls, because they've hurt people, um, and we have stories about you know, women, primarily women, who get beat up and they go back to their abuser just time and time and time again. They have no place else to go um, and they're controlled by that person. So um, it is very frustrating, it is very, um, very hurtful to us as well. Um, so be aware of that. What can we do about it? Well, first off, we can recognize signs of stress. Being irritable. Well, some of our coworkers are just asses anyways all the time. But if you see a change, 
And that's the thing with these warning signs. These are changes in people. Some people are always cranky. Some people, you know, OCD, oh, look, a squirrel, you know that. Insomnia and or nightmares. So I, I had insomnia, chronic insomnia, my whole adult life for about, well, 20 years or so at one point. Um, and about four or five times a year, I would have the same nightmare where I couldn't defend myself. Somebody was trying to kill me. I had a firearm. It wouldn't work. It was like the trigger was welded shut, uh, welded um, in place. And I couldn't defend myself. And just before the fatal round hit me, I'd wake up. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. But insomnia. About three times a year, I'd go through two to three weeks where I could not sleep. i take Unisom. i take um, um, prescription strength meds. And I still just could not sleep. <clears throat> Anxiety. Indecisiveness. Now, I can go drop 70000 on a new truck tomorrow, no problem. But when I was eating candy bars, I'd stand there at the cash register and it'd take me two minutes to figure out which one I wanted. But I knew that was my norm. If something in that changed, that was a warning sign. Survivor's guilt. Um, people feel guilty because they didn't do something right, they did something wrong, or um, they survived an event and their buddy didn't. Okay. Survivor's guilt, I don't have an answer to. But because I did something wrong or I didn't do something I should have, um, the way to prevent that is do the right thing every time. The ones we get in trouble with the most are the ones where we get lazy. Um, it's that regular. It's that frequent flyer. Remember that all frequent flyers will have their fatal event. Um, so if you do the right thing every time, you won't start to cheat and cut corners on patient care. And therefore, um, you shouldn't miss things that you should do. Now, loss of appetite. My wife and I went through a, a tough time once. And over a period of um, 30 days, I lost 40 pounds. Not the world's best diet program, especially because I probably put 70 on afterwards. Loss of interest in sex or the opposite, risky behaviors where now that's all you want to do. So isolation, you want to be alone, right? During that time, um, I would go to work. And I'm a very verbal person. I'm very social. I like to talk with my coworkers. I go into the ER and instead of going to the nurse's station and shooting the shit at shift chain, I just kind of turn the corner, sit at the computer and start to do some whatever. And people knew to stay the hell away from me because I didn't want to talk to anybody. And they knew something was wrong because I just, I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be at work. I didn't want to talk to people. Um, risky behaviors, I did not take part in, um, but risk behaviors. People start smoking, they start taking drugs, they start drinking. They start going home with different people in bars every night. Um, you start to see this sort of behavior in your partners, your friends, your loved ones. These are warning signs, okay? <clears throat> now, um, my nightmares and insomnia went away. Um, I realized about a year after I left one of my places of employment, um, I'd worked there about 20 years and I really liked it. I, I thought I liked it there. Um, and I did, but there was enough stress between the facility and some folks I worked with that, um, after I left this hospital, about a year later, I realized I, I don't have insomnia anymore and I don't have those nightmares. And in fact, in the last, uh, 11 years, I've had a similar nightmare once, just once. So um, even though I liked working there, turns out it was a high stress environment for me. Um, so if you see some of these signs, try to evaluate what's going on in your life and see if you can't do something to change it. Now, stress management, um, change your diet, sugar, caffeine, alcohol. Um, we all know somebody who, oh, they're only an asshole when they drink. Well, deep down, they're an asshole. Alcohol reduces your inhibitions. So if you're depressed, you're going to get more depressed. If you're an asshole, you're going to be more of an asshole. Okay. Um, <clears throat> everything in moderation, though, right? If you 
when I have a beer or a whiskey or a glass of wine because you're stressed, that's okay. Um, if it helps you relax a little bit. Moderation. Don't start having two or start having three, okay? Exercise burns off stress, burns off anxiety, um, cleans your system out a little bit, okay? Relax. Um, find something that makes you happy. Go fishing. Go hiking. Go ride your bicycle, whatever it is. Get a little exercise um, and relax. A balance of work and family is huge. We all know people who work 48 to 72 hours a week for one service. They work another 36 to 48 for another service, and they're volunteers. You have no time to yourself. You have to balance this or else you're going to burn out. Okay? And seek professional help. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> During this time frame, I, I, you know, my wife and I had some trouble. Saw some help, got some help with it, um, and it made a big difference for me. Um, I had a bad call, and this, so this call, nothing bothers me in EMS. Pretty much nothing bothers me. Um, but this one call I had um, was a young lady who was a trauma code. And um, her boyfriend was basically 10 feet behind me, leaning against two stumps, crying while I was intubating his girlfriend on the yellow line of the, of the road. And um, besides the fact that it was this 17 year old girl and you know, a waste of a life, and it didn't have to happen because they were going too fast down a hill, cut a corner, hit the soft shoulder of the road, rolled the car, didn't have seat belts on, Got ejected through a closed sunroof, just a lot of waste to it. The fact was that about you know, six years earlier, on that same corner at the bottom of my long hill in Stratford, my buddy was going too fast, roll, um, spun the car out. I was in the back seat. We went up into the trees and we broke off two trees that were the two stumps that this guy was leaning against. Um, my friends survived, thankfully. Um, we all had pretty significant injuries. I broke my neck in five places. Um, and uh, it made an impact on my life. Now, six or seven years later, I'm working a dead girl who was the same age as I was at the time of my accident in the same spot, only she's dead. Um, a lot of stress. Took a couple of days off. I rode my mountain bike around. I went fishing. Um, I had a couple of wine coolers during the day while I was fishing, um, and I got things back under control. Um, when Dawn died, we had um, CISD come in and chat with us. Um, Frisbee, um, the hospital, the ER staff, the medics, um, and um, the flight service that he worked for all came to it. And I got a lot of um, I got a lot of benefit out of it. Not so much from CISD, but just the fact that they controlled the discussion, and we learned from the flight crews a little bit about why it happened and why different things occurred that led to their their deaths, and it just kind of helped make things better. Um, <clears throat> one of the nurses, though, I'll never forget. She was uh, best friends with Dawn. Uh, screamed and ran out of the room and just it was too much for her so CISD can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing try it once if you have a bad call go to a CISD debriefing and if you don't get any benefit from it or well, don't go to it again um, so CISD the thing I like about CISD is that these are typically police fire um, EMS professionals and nurses and docs who are these counselors and they um, guide the discussion. They also know the resources in your area for say a psychologist who happens to have a background in public safety and knows what we're going through. Um, we had a call um, when I was with Exeter Hospital where the nursing staff, the management of the nursing staff called the um, EAP folks the psych psychologists that worked for the hospital and had them come in and do the debriefing. And within a couple of minutes of the staff talking about it, this psychologist was crying. And, oh my God, I can't imagine that 
what? That's not what you want from this. You know, when, when the psychologist now is a victim, um, it was a bad choice. So um, I highly recommend if you're going to do this, that you contact these folks. New Hampshire CISD, uh, Mark Pru is out of Nashua. Um, you can contact them if you're in New Hampshire, Northern Mass, and uh, they'll come out and do um, debriefings for you. You you can get their information. You could Google them, Mark Pru, New Hampshire CISD. Um, and I'm sure most of the big dispatch centers, um, National Fire, for example, he's a uh, retired National Firefighter uh, Lieutenant, I think, so th they know how to get hold of it. But um, highly recommend it. And again, if in if you go to one and it didn't work for you, um, then don't go to another one. Um, but if it did, go to one. Um, now, one of the EMTs I know is a psychologist, uh, 40 years of psychology background as a psychologist. And he said that the psychiatry field itself frowns on this because they think that in a CISD environment, we relive it too many times and it makes it worse. I don't know. The studies, you can find any study to say yay or nay for anything. But so that's my personal view on it. Um, try it once and uh, go back if it helps. Um, but the other thing is talk to people, talk to your partner on the way back from the call. Um, a lot of us don't like to talk about things. Uh, that was one of the things that frustrated my wife is I never talked about work when I came home. But the thing was, I came home and I shut work off. I wasn't repressing things. I just, when I came home from work, I came home from work. And when I went to work, uh, you know, I was at work. So, um, you know, my personal beliefs are that, you know, if you do everything you can do every time for every patient, do it right, um, then it's not my fault if somebody dies, you know, um, whether it's God, Allah, Buddha, the devil, whatever, somebody has a higher calling for them than I do. Um, but, it, you know, don't let it be my fault. OK, um, Neil Peart from Rush um, wrote in some of his travel books uh, about motorcycling, um, it, you know, as far as accidents and motorcycle accidents, wear all the gear all the time. And whatever happens, don't let it be my fault. I feel the same way with EMS. If it's not my fault, then I can't hold myself responsible if somebody dies. Not everybody lives. It's a fact of life. All right. So recap taking care of ourselves emotionally recognizing how things affect us and how we can do some things to take care of ourselves um so that's part four we'll go to part five here in a moment